It's always nice when you get an applause before you've even spoken. <laughs> I'll take it. Before we get started, um, two things. One, in the spirit of Father Ron Rollheiser, a story. And two, after I finish this story, um, just a business item. The, the story I was reminded of in talking with a woman who's asking me a, a few questions just before we began with our evening prayer here. And one of the questions had to do with my Franciscan habit and whether or not I was a priest, whether or not I was ordained. And I am, in case people were wondering if it matters to you. Um, but it reminded me of a friar from my province who is quite famous internally among our community, among the Franciscans, and, and somewhat famous outside of the community. Um, he's a brother whose trade is shoemaking. He's a cobbler, a leather worker, and makes sandals. One of his big claims to fame was that when he lived and worked, his shop was at our parish at 31st Street in New York City. He made sandals for the stars, including Julia Roberts. And so People Magazine did a little story about him back in the 80s. It was, that was his thing. Anyways, he's a wonderful guy, uh, now lives and works in Boston. But he tells this story about when he was at 31st Street. And those of you who know it in, in Midtown Manhattan, it's a huge, very bustling, busy operation right across the street from Penn Station. So it's, it's where people, you know, it's, it's a mass factory, basically. You have daily mass and confessions round the clock and outreach and a counseling center and spiritual direction and this group and that group and AA and everything. It's, it's all things are happening. And so there's usually a friar who sits at the front desk so that if somebody wants to speak to a friar, wants to talk to a religious, talk to a priest, see, you know, have issues they want to talk out or questions, there's always somebody there. So he was on what we call desk duty. And it was a quiet morning and this little, I don't want to use the pejorative old, we'll use wise lady, <laughs> came in and she had been a regular daily communicant. She had been part of St. Francis of Assisi practically her whole life. I won't tell you how many years that is, but it's multiples of my lifetime. <laughs> she came in and she was very timid and she kind of approached as, as Brother Sebastian tells the story, approached the desk and then kind of turns away shyly and goes, uh, and then Sebastian realized, okay, all right, what's going on here? He says, excuse me, ma'am, ma'am, can I help you? She goes, oh, I don't know, I don't know. I'm just, I'm so embarrassed. And he goes, you know, and of course, Brother Sebastian's intrigued now. And he says, are you sure I can't help you? And she goes, oh, well, okay, I have a question. And I've had this question for decades. I've been coming to church here for all, my whole life, and I see all these different Franciscans, young Franciscans, old Franciscans, tall Franciscans, short Franciscans, skinny Franciscans, not so skinny Franciscans. You get the picture. She says, but I can't tell them apart. And Brother Sebastian, at this point, is very confused. You just describe them, old, young, tall, short. What's that? You can't tell them apart. What's the, I, I, what is, I'm not getting it. And she says, well, your outfit, your robes, I can't tell you apart. He still couldn't figure out what she was getting at. And finally, he said, ma'am, I'm not following. She said, well, how do you know if one of you Franciscans is a priest and one of you Franciscans is a brother? You're wearing the same outfit. <laughs> and he goes, oh, I know it. Okay, this is easy to solve. And it's true. It looks a lot alike. You can't tell from our habit. And she felt relieved at that at first. She goes, well, how do I find out then? And he says, it's very simple, ma'am. Very, very simple. You see, the brothers are much, much, much more handsome. And without missing a beat, she goes, thank you, Father. <laughs> it's allegedly a true story. Now on to prophetic faith in the face of fear. I don't know about you, if you have a favorite, I do. I have a favorite musical. 
My younger brother grew up with a favorite musical. It was Cats, and I hated it. <laughs> but we also liked a bunch of other musicals growing up. My mother was a big fan of uh, The Music Man. So long before I moved to Chicago and past Gary, Indiana, I was singing about that Wells Fargo wagon. But as I've gotten older, my favorite musical has become Stephen Sondheim's show, Into the Woods. Those familiar with the stage production or the 2014 film adaptation, thanks to our friends at Disney, that you know the general idea. There are plots, several of them, from well-known fairy tales like Little Red Riding Hood and Cinderella, right? And they're woven together in an interesting, entertaining, and unabashedly human manner. It's a musical in two acts. There are two parts that are basically evenly divided. The first part of the show ends at the intermission with a full company number that's titled Ever After. I promise you I will not sing it and ruin your ears. Too many real musicians in the room for me to try that. And in that song, Ever After, at the break right before the intermission, the narrator opens with the line, and it came to pass all that seemed wrong was now right, and those who deserve to were certain to live a long and happy life and everybody sang ever after. At this point in the show, midway that is, it seems that all the travails of the characters and their respective and intertwined plots have reached a positive and satisfying conclusion. So the narrator continues. He sings, journey over, all is mended, and it's not just for today, but tomorrow and extended ever after. And everybody in the chorus goes, ever after. <laughs> it goes on a little bit further, and the narrator sings, and I think with the whole company, and they reach the right conclusions, and they, get, and they got what they deserved. Having overcome uncertainty, concern, strife, and danger, the whole company belts at the conclusion of this triumphant song, and you feel it building at the end of this whole musical act, into the woods, then out of the woods, and happy ever after. And the curtain falls, and everybody stands, bravo. That is, of course, until the curtain rises again to begin act two everything begins to unravel. The neat and tidy knots tied at the end of the first act, when everything seemed happy ever after, begin to fray and peel apart. The shadow sides of the characters, their moral complexity, their doubt, their fear, all begin to show. The conclusion of the show, the conclusion of Into the Woods, is not nearly as settled and clear and comfortable as we would have believed if we stopped at the intermission, if we froze the story at the midway point. The conclusion is actually far, far away from happy ever after. Now, one of the reasons I love this musical so much is that we have all seen it before. Now, I don't want to imply that the brilliant composer Stephen Sondheim plagiarized the overarching plot line because I don't seriously believe that he did, at least not consciously. And yet, the structure of Into the Woods bears a curiously remarkable resemblance to the structure of the Gospel of Mark. It's the earliest of the four canonical Gospels. It's the shortest. Mark's account opens with a dramatic and prophetic flourish, jumping right into the ministry of John and the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan. It actually picks up really nicely after where Father Ron's talk left off before dinner. From that point onward, at the opening of Mark's gospel, it's a nonstop series of preaching, healing, calling, and teaching. Until we get to chapter 8, right in the middle of the gospel, split right down the center, 16 chapters, but here we are in the midpoint of Mark's concise account, and Jesus famously asks his disciples a question. Who do people say that I am? Which they respond with a series of rumors and conjecture. He then asks them, but who do you say that I am? This is it. 
This is the big question of the gospel, and it's Simon Peter who takes center stage like the narrator of Into the Woods and proclaims, you are the Messiah, and happy ever after. (laughs) And it would be if we stopped there, if we dropped the curtain, if we didn't come back for the second act. If the Gospel of Mark were like a musical, like Into the Woods, the curtain would fall and intermission would begin. But nearly as soon as Peter answers for the assembled disciples with the correct answer, and he is right, things begin to unravel in a manner worthy of a Markan second act. Jesus affirms the recognition of him as the Messiah and then forbids them from sharing this news and explains that what what it means to be the Messiah involves suffering, death, and resurrection. Upon hearing this, Peter is the first to object. Jesus calls him Satan, tells him to get behind him. And as quickly as the happy ever motif appears, the story goes off the rails, and the disciples continually for the next eight chapters reveal their ignorance, their confusion, their doubts, and their uncertainty. And this continues until the conclusion of the gospel. This is a scene from the garden. Jesus is being led away. And the disciples, at least the male disciples, are making a quick run for it. Mark's account does not end on a triumphant note of happy ever after. Even after the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. But it ends in a brief and startling manner that made so many early Christians so uncomfortable that they added their own endings to the story during the early second century and beyond. Have you noticed that? Notice there's a longer ending and a shorter ending, and they're both in brackets in your Bible? That's because they're not part of the original story. Scholars generally agree that the authentic ending of the Gospel of Mark is found in verse 8 of that chapter, which is why your Bibles have those additions. This is how the Gospel of Mark concludes. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. Do not be afraid. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Here are the last words of Mark's gospel. So they went out and fled from the tomb. For terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Period. Despite the celebratory, exciting feel of recognition found in the midway point of Mark's gospel, the story closes with what New Testament scholars call a promise-failure juxtaposition. This is where God, through a messenger, reveals the divine will to Christ's followers. Do not be afraid, the angel says. He has been raised. Go tell his disciples. But they fail, at least at this point in the story, to put that message into action. Scholars believe that this behavior is reflective of a pattern that runs through the second half of the whole of Mark's gospel. Once the theme of discipleship as the way of the cross has been introduced in chapter 8. Jesus lays it out before them. There are at least two important insights for us in the way Mark's gospel eventually plays out, or doesn't play out for that matter. Both of these insights follow from the distinctively open-ended manner in which Mark's gospel ends. It seems to suggest in no uncertain terms that the story is actually not over, but continues in the period of time between the resurrection of the Lord and his second coming. It's just open-ended. They told no one because they were afraid. It is the time of the initial hearers of the kerygma, 
that time afterwards where people are proclaiming the news of this experience and trying to make sense of what's going on. And it is our time as well. We're still in that time. From the moment those three women flee the tomb and tell no one until the second coming, that includes June 12th, 11th, 11th, 2019, and 12th for that matter, I think. Unless the Lord comes back tonight, in which case uh, I reserve the right to be corrected. <laughs> It's not a straightforwardly happy ending leading to a straightforwardly positive conclusion like Sondheim's happy ever after at the end of the first act. Instead, in the words of John Donahue and the late Daniel Harrington, the Jesuit New Testament scholar, the language of Mark's ending is what we might describe as a cliffhanger. What remains is an honest accounting of the everyday reality we all face as those who, like the women at the empty tomb, stand ourselves before the face of uncomfortable uncertainty, mystery, and fear. With this in mind, one key insight follows a rather direct reading of Mark chapter 16, verse 8. Namely, that if Christian discipleship is about embracing the call to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to announce the saving power of God and the resurrection of Christ in the Spirit, and bear witness in word and deed to the inbreaking of the kingdom of God, then indeed fear is the enemy of discipleship because succumbing to fear stops one from living out that vocation. They told no one because they were afraid. According to Fame Perkins, a New Testament scholar, it is very likely that Mark understood this dynamic and uses the conclusion of the gospel as an allegory for the dangers of fear. Mark's not an idiot. Ending on the note of fear in the silence of the followers, especially the women who had been actually the most faithful followers up to this point. Shout out to the women. Let's not forget. At a point where, as you can tell from this scene, oh, it's kind of light, isn't it? Can you see the screen all right? Okay. That the male disciples at this point had already abandoned Christ out of fear. The boys were the weak ones. They took their toys and went home pretty early that weekend. But it calls to mind that many times Mark had already signaled fear throughout the gospel, particularly the preceding eight chapters, the second half of the story. Professor Perkins explains, readers have also learned that fear demonstrates lack of faith among Jesus' followers. Their fear during the storms at sea indicates a hard-hearted misunderstanding. The, the, the disciples do not recognize that Jesus exercises God's saving powers over the waters of chaos. Peter's inappropriate response to the transfiguration vision in chapter 9 is motivated by fear. The passion predictions elicit fear and misunderstanding. In all of these cases, Perkins says, fear isolates the disciples from Jesus. There's a distance Jesus is not present at the tomb. The women's flight, like that of the male disciples before that, illustrates the effect of such isolation. What happens when we're far away from Jesus or isolate ourselves from him? In this way, fear is both a signal of our isolation from Christ, a lack of trust in God, and an obstacle to fulfilling the baptismal call we received from him. We, like the first disciples, we will face the same challenge of following Jesus. Mark has insisted that the cross is the way to life for those who wish to follow Jesus. He does not compromise the paradox of suffering service by producing a glorious triumph in the end. Mark's description of discipleship is a lot more honest. Think about it for a minute. It's tough. In John's gospel, Jesus exhorts his followers, you got to pick up your cross and follow me. you got to love one another as I have loved you. It's that agopic love of self-sacrifice. But guess what? At the end, it's going to be great. I'm going to show up three times after the resurrection. I'm going to cook a little fish barbecue by the Sea of Galilee for my followers. I'm going to allow Peter to say he loves me three times, make that right, and then pff, I'm off the ascension, right? You can laugh. It's okay, right? The other Gospels, they're not, not truthful. It's just that Mark's account strikes to the heart of the challenges of what it means to be a follower of Christ, 
It's an open-ended question where we don't have the security of knowing that, yeah, it's going to be hard, but you know what? We're going to see a positive outcome to be sure. And therefore, because I think it's the most honest of the canonical Gospels, it is perhaps for us the most frightening. Another insight worth noting is the brilliant way that Mark's account sends an implicit but strong message, and this is a positive thing, about the saving power of Christ and of the gospel itself. It doesn't seem so at first glance. But it's evident from the way that Mark's gospel ends that the women leave and remain silent out of fear. We know that. Theirs is a failure of discipleship, at least at first. And yet, hmm, curious, isn't it? And yet, the story of the empty tomb and the message of an angel are eventually told. And it's interesting, according to the story, those three women are the only witnesses. How did that story get written down? Have you thought about that? There is no narrator like Into the Woods. There are only the early followers of Christ. They clearly did not remain silent forever. While this not-so-happy ending is a caution about the true cost of discipleship in the face of fear, it's also a counterintuitive source of encouragement to persevere despite failure and despite our own disobedience or sinfulness. The challenges placed before us, us, the modern readers, the modern disciples, and it's placed before us as a call to believe in the saving power of Christ who transforms human limitations and delivers from persecution and death. The New Testament scholar Andrew Lincoln has even described Mark's ending as notably pastoral precisely for this reason. It's actually a counterintuitively comforting story. He says, if as disciples... The readers fail to stand up to the rigors of the way of the cross set out in the story. All is not necessarily lost. Christ's powerful word of promise will still prevail. That gives me a little bit of hope. Our spiritual journeys, yours and mine, are not much different from that of Mark's depiction of the first disciples. At times, like Peter in the middle of the gospel or the characters at the end of Act 1 of Into the Woods, we will be overjoyed, we'll be content, we'll be satisfied, we'll be clear about the meaning of our faith and the role of Christ in our lives, and we'll sing happy ever after. Until, of course, the next act. But also like the disciples in the chorus on Sondheim stage, things will unravel, threats will surface, dangers will persist, and fear will face us. What will we do then? In the remainder of my presentation tonight, I want to look at three illustrations of what I'm calling prophetic faith in the face of fear. Three individuals, two Christians and a Jew who provide us with insights about and models for us about what it means to take that Mark in, that Gospel of Mark lesson of fear to heart. Now, I could have picked so many examples, and I think from our lineup of speakers, we're going to hear some more tomorrow. I could have talked about Sister Dorothy Stang in the Amazon, talk about Dorothy Day, or Howard Thurman, or Sister Thea Bowman, or Martin Luther King Jr., or Bonhoeffer, or pick one. And I went back and forth. I thought about having like a whole list, but then I thought I wouldn't do justice in the short period of time. And then I thought, well, what if, ah, screw time. I'll go on as long as I want. And then I thought, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> Maybe I could pull that off tomorrow night when you're trapped. But I still have to see you in the morning. <laughs> but these three figures come together in a way that I hope will make sense by the end of our time this evening and they build upon one another's example. First, we turn to the great 20th century Trappist monk and author Thomas Merton. He reminds us that the root of all violence is fear. Next, we will explore the wisdom of a young Jewish woman named Eddie Hillison, whose own reflections on facing fear in the wake of the Shoah, in the face of the Holocaust, offers a sobering and inspiring account of faith worthy of emulation. And then finally, we shall listen to the voice of the Salvadoran martyr, 
St. Oscar Romero, whose experience of conversion from fear to faith cost him his life for the sake of the poor and afflicted. While none of these three wisdom figures and guides, among so many others, as I mentioned, we could have considered offer us any kind of justification to proclaim happy ever after, they do offer us a path forward. They chart something of a course in the face of fear, and they bear witness to Mark's claim that despite our inadequacies, despite our doubts and failures, the power of God will nevertheless prevail. The root of war is fear. The best-known prayer Thomas Merton ever penned, which appeared in his short 1958 book, Thoughts in Solitude, famously opens with the lines that you probably all know by heart. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. It's one of my favorite prayers. And it's the prayers that, it's a prayer that's near the hearts of so many other people I encounter I've heard several people today talk about those in 12-step programs, and for a lot of folks in recovery, that's a prayer that's like Psalm 23, near and dear to their hearts. It's also something I find that my students really love, particularly as they're discerning their own call in this life and making difficult choices about their futures. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. This prayer echoes the poetry and simplicity of the psalmists, whose prayers ring through the centuries of the anxiety of uncertain futures in fearful present moments. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Merton concludes his original psalm, like the psalmist in Psalm 22, with a prayer of trust in God. He says, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are ever with me and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Merton was no stranger to peril or to fear. He was orphaned by age 16, and itinerant most of his young adult life. The eventual Cistercian monk regularly encountered uncertainty and expressed a desire for stability, security, and solitude that always seemed to elude him, at least to a degree he felt was satisfying. The Augustinian restlessness of his life, like St. Augustine who says, you know, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O Lord. I think that could have been Merton's motto, right? That restlessness in his life and writings led to a prolific output at the direction at first of his monastic superiors. In his writings, his example invited millions of Catholics, even today, as well as other readers, of other Christian communities and no tradition whatsoever into his own spiritual journey with the hope that such proximity to his journey might prove worthwhile to others. In time, Merton became more and more attuned to what the Second Vatican Council would describe as the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the women and men of this age. This led to his consideration of the dynamics of violence in our world. In October 1961, Thomas Merton wrote an article for the Catholic Worker newspaper, co-founded by Servant of God, Dorothy Day. It was later published as a chapter in his book, New Seeds of Contemplation. How many people have read that? How many people have it on their shelf but haven't read it, but <laughs> intend to read it? Well, if you want to take that off your shelf or revisit it, the chapter is called The Root of War is Fear. Merton begins by diagnosing the pervasiveness of fear which is the root of all war and every kind of violence, he says. As an effect of the widespread lack of trust that women and men have, this is at the heart of this fear. He writes, it's not merely that they do not trust one another, they do not even trust themselves. And in a way, echoing the allegory contained at the end of Mark's gospel, Merton adds, they cannot trust anything because they have ceased to believe in God. Fear is isolating, separating. And as we saw last night in the philosopher Martha Nussbaum's keen observation, fear is narcissistic. Merton takes this sense of fear's self-serving valence and analyzes it in the key of Christian spirituality. He recognized that fear is not merely an objective external threat, though that sometimes is the case 
like when we encounter a predator. More often than not, fear is tied to the hatred we harbor internally. Merton explains that, and I quote, It is not only our hatred of others that is dangerous, but also, and above all, our hatred of ourselves, particularly that hatred of ourselves, which is too deep and too powerful to be consciously faced. For it is this which makes us see our own evil and in others and unable to see it in ourselves. In the narcissistic turn to the self as a result of fear, we seek answers and we seek a means of alleviation of our anxiety by scapegoating and by othering. Merton writes that, and I'm quoting again, we tend unconsciously to ease ourselves still more of the burden of guilt that is in us by passing it on to somebody else. The temptation is then to account for my fault by seeing an equivalent amount of evil in someone else. Hence, I start to minimize my own sins and compensate for doing so by exaggerating the faults of others. The spiritual ill, the kind of illness that arises as a result of fear is the self-centered protection of oneself, not just physically, but psychologically too. We, we saw that last night. More often than not, most of us do not face physically violent threats in every moment of our lives or every day, God willing, and I pray that that's not the case. But rather, we do regularly encounter real or perceived threats threats to our egos, for instance. In the face of fear, we hunker down into a fortress of our own making. Isolated from one another and therefore God, fear governs our thoughts, it governs our wills and our actions in a self-defensive posture that blames others for the anxiety and discomfort that we may naturally or increasingly artificially be feeling. Tapping into the prehistoric self-defense mechanisms we looked at last night, those who manipulate our tendency to fear suggest that the only solution is complete surrender of our agency to those who claim an ability to eliminate the threat. And this in turn provides cover for sinful and horrendous behavior. Merton characterizes this process in the following way. He says, we drive ourselves mad with our preoccupation and in the end, there is no outlet left but violence. We have to destroy something or someone. By that time, we've created for ourselves a suitable enemy, a scapegoat in whom we have invested all the evil in the world. He is the cause of every wrong. He is the fomenter of all conflict. If he can only be destroyed, conflict will cease. Evil will be done with. There will be no more war. Too often, our tendency is to find blame out there for things that we most often fear. And yet Merton tells Christians to look first within themselves for the fear that shapes violence in our own hearts, spiritual violence, emotional violence, psychological violence, and physical violence begins here. Merton offers two important insights in the face of fear found in each of us. First, he challenges Christians to recognize the many ways so many of us hold on to willful ignorance. That is a powerful problem. We desire to not know. I just don't want to know. We don't want to know about reality. We succumb instead to commercial or political or even religious co-option of our evolutionary anxiety that we talked about last night and embracing, therefore, some presented object to be feared, whether it's a person or a community or an idea or a state, it's them, it's him, it's her, it's that place or that religion or that way of thinking. This illusory phenomenon has hardened our hearts and prevents us from seeing anything good or righteous or lovable in those we believe are our enemies or the source of our problems. Diagnosing the social and political signs of the time, Merton suggests that perhaps in the end, the first real step toward peace would be a realistic acceptance of the fact that our political ideals are perhaps to a great extent 
illusions and fictions to which we cling, uh, to which we cling our motives that are not always perfectly honest. He goes on, he says that because of this, we prevent ourselves from seeing any good or any practic practicability, excuse me, in the political ideals of our enemies, which may of course be in many ways even more illusory and dishonest than our own. We will never get anywhere, he says, unless we can accept the fact that policies and politics and that the practice of politics is an inextricable tangle of good and evil motives in which perhaps the evil predominate, but where one must continue to hope doggedly in what little good can still be found. The call is in part to resist the polarization and the vilification that comes with succumbing to fear of the other, acknowledging that the other's motivations may not necessarily be without malice or goodwill. Merton nevertheless calls for a restoration of trust that leads to an honest reckoning of our interdependence. Again, fear makes us think it's all about us. The greatest lie that fear tells us is that we can and we should go it alone. When such a possibility is not only morally bankrupt, but in fact, actually impossible. The second insight that Merton presents to us is the fact that only love, he says, which means humility, can exorcise the fear which is at the root of all war. Now to many hearers, none in this room because you're all deeply spiritual and reflective people, but let's say those who are jaded and cynical, again, nobody here, but there may be some listening later. People who might be jaded or cynical or fed up with this age, by the fear of this age, by the rhetoric, the idea that the notion that love is the answer can sound like a naive poem at best and a disillusioned farce at worst. It's important to see what Merton means by love here, though. The qualification of humility is important for us to pay attention to. The love Merton is talking about is the agopic love of Christ. This is the love which pervades the Gospels. It's the love that we find in the New Testament letters. Whereas love in the face of fear is often reduced to the Greek senses of philia or eros. Philia is in the city in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, which means the city of? And sisterly love. Don't forget about the sisters. Yeah, it's the love of siblings, the love of friends, the love of neighbors and classmates and people we get along with and people we like. And eros, that romantic love. It's not just about sex, but it's also about sex. But eros is the love that gives us energy. It's the love that keeps you going and going and going, thinking about the person with which Eros is attached. Your spouse, even your best friend in a non-sexual way, non-romantic way. It's just an energy where you're like, you meet somebody you really like, somebody new for the first time, and you're like, I can't wait to hang out with them again. That's Eros. Those are easy sorts of love. They come naturally. They come comfortably or they come from without, they give us energy. Agape is something far different. It's demanding, it's a self-sacrificing love and it requires humility. It's the kind of love that Jesus describes in John's gospel over and over again. The love that has been shown to us by him, the love that was first shown to him by God. It's the love that leads one to lay down her life for a friend or to put one another to put another before oneself. It is the love that is depicted as in the parabolic descriptions of the reign of God when Jesus is constantly flipping expectations upside down. It's the kind of love that unsettles the status quo of our fear-induced self-centeredness, jealousy, envy, anger, and violence. It's the love that Paul is talking about to the poor people at Corinth who, like the disciples in Mark's gospel, don't have a clue. Now, how many people have been to a Christian wedding mm, ever? All right, there is a 132% chance that you've heard in the second reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. <laughs> how does it go? You know, love is patient, love is kind. Oh, yeah, all right, very good. We have a very biblically literate or a very uh, wedding-prone group of people here. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love when couples pick that reading. I really do. In, in the Catholic Church, you know, there's, you know, this little booklet, Together for Life, that a lot of parishes use to help couples plan the pre-cana process. And they tear that little sheet out, and they can put it as like E4, B6, and they're like, bingo, yep, you get married. <laughs> and inevitably, you know, it's five out of six times at least, they pick 1 Corinthians 13. And they do it because they think, oh, my God, that's us. All right? <laughs> And I love it. You just sit there. Sit there during the second reading. The next wedding you're at, I promise you, is a very good chance it's going to happen. Now watch the couple. You know, the cousin, you know, the bride's cousin gets up there, and she's been studying this thing, and she goes, a reading from first of the Corinthians. <laughs> love is patient. Love is kind. And then the couple look at each other and think, oh, that's us. <laughs> love does not bear grudges. Love does not hold jealousy. Faith hope and love and the greatest of these is love and they go oh my god that's us no you're schmoopy <laughs> and that is not what that passage is about <laughs> i love when they pick that because they're going to get a very interesting homily but it's not the homily they were expecting <laughs> it's agape it's a love that demands think about a love that is patient and kind it's not erotic. It's not the friendly love of philia. It's the love of sacrifice. It's the love of putting another first. It's a love that Christ talks about over and over again. It's a love that doesn't come naturally or unthinkingly, but we have to will it and choose it. It is actually a good reading for couples if they get that. But it's not just about them. It's about the love that we're all called to show to everyone. It is a love that, as the first letter of John reminds us, finds no fear within itself because, as the author of that letter says, perfect love drives out fear. And this is the love that is, like the rational hope of Christian faith, a choice. You don't get to choose eros. It chooses you. But agape, you have to choose that. As the theologian Colleen Griffith explains, living by hope is not a choice made once and for all for a lifetime, but it's an ongoing one, decided in freedom many times over. Again, a good message for couples starting out. The decision to hope is never static, but something that presents itself anew as circumstances of life change. In naming this humble love, this agapic love, Merton calls us back to the importance of hope as an authentic human response to fear, which silos us in our own self-centered and antagonistic worlds. If we are fearful, remember Nisbam I shared last night says you can't hope and fear at the same time. And if we fear, the only thing we love, if we love anything at all, is ourselves. As the theologian Richard Lenon says, hope expresses the recognition that we depend on one another, that we are called to solidarity with one another. Hope then, he says, underpins human communion, which for Merton is the answer to the fear that is at the root of all war. Merton's witness is one of personal accountability and agency. He challenges us. It's not you know, he, he's not concerned so much about some kind of 12-point plan that the United Nations is going to come up with for how we can end war. He says it begins with us. He challenges us to recall that love and hope are a choice, that fear and violence are not inevitable. It doesn't have to be. To this end, he admonishes us to be intellectually and spiritually honest about our personal and collective claims that we so often throw about easily. We say things like, let there be peace on earth. I wish there were peace. Why is there so much violence? Why is there so much hatred? Merton says, so instead of loving what you think is peace, love other men and women and love God above all. And instead of hating the people you think are war makers, hate the appetites and the disorder in your own soul, which are the causes of war. If you love peace, he says, then hate injustice, hate tyranny, hate greed. But hate these things in yourself, not in another. 
Eddie Hillisum is not a name as well known as Anne Frank. But her short life and profound witness to faith and hope during the Shoah, what we often call the Holocaust, is as powerful and perhaps even more so than Anne Frank's. As theologian Christopher Premuk explains, he says, Hillisum was a young Jewish woman who lived in Amsterdam during the Nazi occupation and was murdered in Auschwitz at age 29. Her diaries give witness to a spirit in humanity that defies rational explanation, a light and hope that flashes forth even from within the horrors of racial genocide. She did not grow up in a particularly devout family, nor was her experience of Judaism or religion in any other sense a major part of her social life. We see this actually uh, in the writings of one of her biographers who remarks that after her death and after the publication of her diaries, some of her acquaintances, some of her friends from that time, the time of her university studies, were amazed to learn of Eddie Hillisum's spiritual development during the war years, during a period in which she adopted clearly different interests and a different circle of friends than they had realized. The diary she kept during the last few years of her life and the extant letters she penned during the same time reveal a complex spiritual seeker whose journey exhibits a tremendous arc of growth, understanding, maturity, and self-awareness. Hers was a deeply embodied experience of spiritual discovery. She did not shy away from the sensual and the sexual, the intellectual and the artistic, the physical, the corporeal, and the divine. And most of this unfolded at the time of Nazi occupation of the Netherlands, which understandably produced deep social anxiety and fear. As scholar Patrick Woodhouse notes, the driving force that took her spirituality deeper was the terror. The terror on the streets and in the rumors circulating in Amsterdam that, drew, that Jews across Europe were being rounded up, shipped to concentration camps, and exterminated. He adds that in Hillisum's context, surviving in the tasks of daily life became ever more exhausting. The level of anxiety among the Jewish population was rising. Hope and any sense of community became scarce commodities. The world around her was disintegrating and everywhere there was terrible fear. This is what we might constitute or classify as natural fear. <laughs> Though it's different from the manipulation of anxiety that led to the scapegoating of Jews in Europe, that led to an unnatural fear. Those who were the objects of that terror, of that fear, experienced that anxiety in a very real way. And how Eddie Hillisum responded even to that natural fear gives us some insight about how we might be called by Christ to respond to fear in our lives. Just a couple of weeks before she was sent to Camp Vesterbork, which is one of the Nazis' quote, transit camps, which was serving as an in-between waypoint before being sent to a concentration or extermination camp, Hillisum included the following prayer in her diary. She writes, Sunday morning, 12 July, 1942. Dear God, these are anxious times. Tonight for the first time I lay in the dark with burning eyes as scene after scene of human suffering passed before me. I shall promise you one thing, God, just one very small thing. I shall never burden my today with cares about my tomorrow, although that takes some practice. Each day is sufficient unto itself. I shall try to help you, God, to stop my strength ebbing away, though I cannot vouch for it in advance. But one thing is becoming increasingly clear to me, that you cannot help us, that we must help you to help ourselves. And that is all we can manage these days, and also all that really matters, that we safeguard that little piece of you, God, in ourselves and perhaps in others as well. Alas, there doesn't seem to be much you yourself can do about our circumstances, about our lives. 
neither do I hold you responsible. You cannot help us, but we must help you and defend your dwelling place inside us to the last. Here we witness a sense of Hillisum's internal resolve as she recognizes both the external social dominance of fear and anxiety and the irrational hope that some have for a God who might helicopter into this time and space to resolve the problem from without. She explains in her prayer that God doesn't operate this way. She got that, as painful as that is. Rather than addressing the legitimate objects of fear from without, one must recognize the internal resolve occasioned by God's closeness to each of us. That was her insight. In the Christian tradition, we might talk about this reality, as Father Ron did this afternoon, as grace. Our Catholic Christian tradition holds that grace is always, first and foremost, the gift of God's self, the Holy Spirit. More on that tomorrow. But grace within us, God's indwelling within us. For Hillisum, though she was not Christian, it is a matter of recognizing, as she put it, that little piece of God in ourselves. She saw that spark of divinity, what we Christians would call the Holy Spirit, which aids us in responding to the fear and terror we encounter. The ethicist William McDonough has argued that fear was Eddie Hillisum's fundamental problem, even before she was imprisoned. He believed that even those other struggles she discusses in her diaries day in and day out, she struggles with things like ego. She was really into psychoanalysis, so she's always trying to unpack herself in conversations and relationships she had with her therapist. That's for another talk, not for tonight. But she struggles with what she identifies to as selfish love, that philia and eros, we would say in the Greek. She describes those as symptoms of maybe a deeper fear. Her response to this fundamental, this deep fear and its symptoms was a turn toward interiority, not in the narcissistic and self-serving sense that Martha Nussbaum warns about, but in a spirit of openness, of reflection, and honest evaluation of her emotion, of her own thoughts, of her own outlook on the world. In a way, Eddie Hillisa models for us what Merton's exhortation to interiority in discerning and rejecting fear and violence is in the first place. Remember, he says, hate tyranny, hate greed, hate violence, but hate them in yourself. Faced with true threats, real threats, real horrors that beset her and her community, Hillisum's turn to the interior was not an escape. That's important. Fear sometimes is an escape. Hers was a constructive spiritual response to a terrifying sign of her times. She acknowledges very early in her diaries that the fear that is elicited by the anxiety of what is underway, the horrors that were unfolding before her and her fellow Jewish women and men, her sisters and brothers, those that so many of us worldwide ignored, she says, what is unfolding around her affects the interior life and spirit of all of us. For Hillisum, the most immediate and dangerous consequence of succumbing to that fear is the arousal of hatred. For instance, in the evening of March 15, 1941, she writes, to sum up, this is what I really want to say. Nazi barbarism evokes the same kind of barbarism in ourselves one that would involve the same methods if we could do as we wanted right here and now. We have to reject that barbarism within us. We must not fan the hatred within us because if we do, the world will not be able to pull itself one inch further out of the mire. On that very same day, she wrote that, and I quote, it is the problem of our age Hatred of Germans poisons everyone's minds. Hillisum had good reason to hate German Nazis, but she saw this ostensibly justifiable hatred as reflective of the problem itself, a problem of fear and violence that is very similar to what Merton was warning us about. Therefore, Hillisum expresses her conviction that the necessary response to fear is a refusal to hate. 
even in the face of the most seemingly justifiable reason for hatred. And here I cannot help but think of the Parkland students and what was shared this afternoon in the Q&A comment. As Patrick Woodhouse notes, this was not merely something expressed by a naive or Pollyannish young woman early in the Nazi occupation. It wasn't just like, oh, things are going to be great. It's all going to turn out fine. Instead, it was something she discerned at a critical point in her own examination of self and something she holds right up to the end when she is put on a train to Auschwitz. Woodhouse explains that as her story unfolds, she shares her people's increasingly desperate plight and at the same time, her conviction deepens and is expressed in even more resolute language. I'll be honest with you. I don't know how she did it. Throughout her diary entries and letters, one sees this conviction growing more strongly. She writes on September 23rd, 1942, that all I really wanted to say is this, she writes. We have so much work to do on ourselves that we shouldn't even be thinking of hating our so-called enemies. We are hurtful enough to one another as it is. I see no alternative. Each of us must turn inward and destroy in himself, her use of the word, but it all applies to women too, in himself or herself, all that he or she thinks ought to do, that he or she ought to destroy in others. And remember that every atom of hate we add to this world makes it still more inhospitable. How did she arrive at this position? How is it in the face of such fear that Hillisum could center herself such that she refused to hate those clearly her enemies? The general consensus is that she was a mystic in the truest sense of the term. As Anne-Marie Kidder reminds us, mysticism assumes that people have the capacity to experience God in a direct, unmediated fashion. This capacity can be repressed, but not destroyed. It can be neglected, but not eliminated. Hillisum understood this and wrote for herself and those who would come after her that one must not forget this truth, even in the face of the most terrifying fear. Since she could not change her outside world, in other words, she resolved to begin working on the world that lay within. Hillisum bore witness to the reality of God's immediate presence to all people, even amid the most unjust and unforeseen circumstances. She did not take the suffering she or her fellow European Jews experienced lightly, but instead signaled in her reflections that life was about more and that far worse than suffering in itself was succumbing to the hatred fear instigated within our hearts. As Robert Ellsberg, who spoke here maybe last year or the year before, writes so eloquently about the lives of saints, capital S saints and other saints, he wrote about Hillisum and he said, in the midst of suffering and injustice, she believed the effort to preserve in one's heart a spirit of love and forgiveness was the greatest task that any person could perform. This, she felt, was her vocation. On July 2nd, 1942, she writes the following. Suffering is not beneath human dignity. I mean, it is possible to suffer with dignity and without. I mean, most of us in the West don't understand the art of suffering and experience a thousand fears instead. We cease to be alive, being full of fear, bitterness, hatred, and despair. God knows it's only too easy to understand why. But when we are deprived of our lives, are we really deprived of very much? And I wonder, and I wonder if there is much difference between being consumed here by a thousand fears or in Poland by a thousand lice and by hunger. We have to accept death as part of life, even the most horrible of deaths. Wow. The lessons of Hillisum's writings and witness are manifold. At the heart of her lessons for us stands a conscious and deliberate stance in the face of fear, a prophetic recognition that even in the midst of humanity's worst tendencies, its worst threats, its worst actions, nobody can take away our interior lives. Hate is not inevitable. Internal and external violence does not have to be 
We can be otherwise, and there is a choice, and we can make that choice. But this choice cannot easily be made in a moment without a commitment to discernment, reflection, prayer, and the examination of oneself. Eddie Hillisum and so many like her, their lives are not heroic because they lived one way and then in the face of the most terrifying of circumstances, they miraculously decided to choose something different. Their whole lives led to this. This choice led to her being able to write in a 1942 letter shortly before her death. What matters is not whether we preserve our lives at any cost, but how we preserve them. Like Merton Hillisum understood that the root of all war, of all violence, including the violence of hatred even for one's perceived enemy, is fear. That Eddie Hillisum was able to make another choice, one reflected in her famous final letter, thrown from the train as she and her family were transported to Auschwitz, in which we read that they, in her words she writes, they left the camp singing. Father and mother firmly and calmly, Misha too. This proposes to the world that another way of being is possible. A way of being more fully human even in the face of inhumanity. A way of embracing faith even in the face of fear. The choice is ours. And that choice may result in consequences we would never choose to encounter. Father Ron mentioned that in his talk too. And we know from the gospel accounts that Jesus had a sense of this. He struggled with his own experience of fear. Let this cup pass from me, Father, if it's possible. It was also true for Archbishop Oscar Romero of El Salvador. Whereas Eddie Hillisum occupied a position in her time and place that can rightly be said to have become increasingly powerless, at least with regard to her exterior life, some Christians find themselves in positions in which the choice to live in the world according to the gospel affects their use and abuse of power. Such was the case of Oscar Romero, the martyred Archbishop of San Salvador. What is striking about Romero's story is not just that he regularly risked his life by speaking out publicly against the injustices he witnessed in his society at the hands of the rich and the powerful, but more relevantly, how exactly he came to that place to begin with. Theologian Michael Lee in his recent book, which I highly recommend, titled Revolutionary Saint, The Theological Legacy of Oscar Romero, he emphasizes the importance of conversion as a ph phenomenon in the life and faith of Romero, as well as a significant and reoccurring theme in his preaching and writings in the last years of Romero's life. Recognizing the centrality of conversion as a concept in the Christian tradition, seen frequently in the Christian scriptures and the narratives of so many holy women and men, Lee notes that Romero's narrative of conversion has often been hijacked by partisan interests and portrayed in one of two extreme ways. Either he was a sellout who was duped by Marxist revolutionaries and communist sympathizers, this is what Lee calls the conservative narrative expressed by those in civil and ecclesial power in the 1970s and 80s. And very, and just be honest with you, the reason why his canonization for being martyred while celebrating the Eucharist was delayed for three decades. Or, but it's not just one-sided, or it's been misconstrued another way, that he had a miraculous singular moment of change becoming overnight a champion of political resistance. This is what Lee would call the radical narrative expressed by those in social change movements of the time who want him to be the poster child of kind of revolutionary action right now. Neither does justice to the ongoing, slow-moving experience of metanoia, of turning, of conversion that we see in Romero's own spiritual and ministerial journey. It is true that most of his ministerial life took the form of being an ecclesiastical bureaucrat by his own admission. He is what we call a chancery rat. 
I think the old term in the 50s was a pencil pusher. <laughs> he acknowledged his own limited horizon during decades of priestly and Episcopal ministry prior to becoming rather unexpectedly to all, including himself, Archbishop of San Salvador. And yet, the way he describes this professional and personal shift in his life was akin, in his language, he writes, it's like a return home. That's so different from the sudden breaks in one way or another. It's like he's been journeying as a pilgrim, striving to go back home, trying to get there. His conversion was away from the insular sense of protectionism that his ecclesiastical rise to power reflected. He was very isolated. He talked about that. He says that he moves now toward a new realization of reality as it actually was in the daily experiences of women and men that he was called to serve. He was not a bad man or a bad priest or a bad bishop. But when he became Archbishop of San Salvador, there were things that allowed him to see reality for what it is. And that is what the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, shows that prophets are all about. Prophets do not predict the future. They can't tell you who's going to win the basketball championship. Father Ron, stop asking me. <laughs> Prophets don't predict anything. Prophets call out the difference between the world as God intends it to be and the world as it actually is and says we have to do something about this gap. Lee notes that this movement can best be described as a move toward greater recognition of the complex and dire reality of social and structural sin and the need for the church to reevaluate its place in society. Lee explains that Romero's new vision of society was not just a political, social, or economic insight. It led him to reconfigure theologically the church's role in relation to that society. His conversion toward the people of God and the public witness Christian discipleship demanded of all the baptized, but especially those who are entrusted with leadership in the faith community, i.e. bishops and religious and priests and lay leaders and catechists, required that he not succumb to fear. Fear of misunderstanding. Fear of the loss of financial support. Oh man, I speak to so many dioceses and so many clergy. I know, I can't stand priests either. I am one of them. No, I'm just kidding. And that was a joke. <laughs> but the truth is, there's a lot of fear of everyday realities. Well-meaning, good-intentioned pastors who are afraid they're not going to be able to pay off the loan for the roof. Fear that there isn't going to be enough in the collection to make the salaries for that week. Fear of lots of other things, fear of rejection, and ultimately fear of safety and death. Romero was aware of this. The Romero had lived faithfully as a Christian and a priest. His life and ministry were transformed as he placed the suffering and oppressed poor of El Salvador at the center of his focus. Now, all of a sudden, paying the bill for the roof isn't as important when people are being disappeared and executed. And that led to a shift in his practice demonstrated in the exercise of his primary ministerial obligation to preach to and serve the people of San Salvador, that the gospel of Jesus Christ took precedent over fears of perception and the work of peace and justice took precedent over fears for physical safety and even his earthly life. This was manifested most clearly in his preaching during the years of 1977 until his murder on March 24th, 1980. As early as 1977, Romero preached about the explicit connection between fear and the proclamation of the gospel. He said, to be a Christian now means to have the courage to preach the true teaching of Christ and not be afraid of it, not be silent out of fear and preach something easy that won't cause problems. Don't rock the boat, Father. Several years ago, and this is not to toot my own horn, it's to acknowledge how difficult it is and, and what minimal experience I've had myself. I was living in Boston at our Shrine Church St. Anthony's in downtown Crossing. And I, for some reason, was tasked with presiding and preaching on our big Good Friday service. It was the same Good Friday a year after Mar the marathon bombing. And uh, Zarnayev, the, the one brother that survived who carried out the bombing, was down the road in a federal prison awaiting his trial. 
And one of the big items on the table is that Massachusetts had outlawed capital punishment many years earlier and the residents of Boston and the citizens of Massachusetts did not want this man. They wanted him tried and sentenced to prison as he rightly deserves, but not to be executed. And yet the federal government said, it's a capital crime, it's terrorism, we're gonna execute him. In preaching on Good Friday, I talked about the fact that there are men and women on death row and are scheduled to be executed today. And where were we? Are we there when they were nailed to the cross? And sometimes it should cause us to tremble. A woman came up to me screaming in the lobby after mass and said, how dare you bring your politics into this place? Romero says to be a Christian in this hour means to have the courage that the Holy Spirit gives in the sacrament of confirmation, to be valiant soldiers of Christ the King, to make his teaching prevail. It's not my politics. Either all life is sacred or none of it is. Romero says to reach hearts and proclaim to them the courage that one must have to defend God's law, God's law. Romero's conversion to a deeper appreciation for and awareness of the radical call of the gospel led him to see how it was not only negligent for the church to acquiesce to the fear stoked by political and ecclesiastical powers, but it was in fact sinful. His spirituality was not governed by the need to protect himself. It didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen instantly. It was a lifelong process. He wasn't somebody at, at this point that allowed himself to succumb to the closing in on himself that Martha Nussbaum describes, but rather his spirituality was informed by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in whom we are all baptized. All of us who are baptized, but he recognized especially those who are ordained, called to lead their sisters and brothers, must put their trust in that Christ. In March 1978, he said, those who put their faith in the risen one and work for a world more just, who protest against the injustices of the present system, against the abuses of unjust authorities, against the wrongfulness of humans exploiting humans, all those who begin their struggle with the resurrection of the great liberator, they alone are authentic Christians. In time, Romero was able to diagnose the effects of fear in his own flock, the Church of El Salvador. As Nussbaum and others outlined for us in my lecture last evening, fear has a way of isolating individuals, breaking trust in community, instilling a sense of hatred for the other. Romero recognized that real faith, the authentic faith of Jesus Christ, is the only antidote to the fear of war and violence, to greed and suffering. He wrote that, a Christian's authenticity is shown in difficult hours. By Christian, I mean every member of God's people, whether layperson, religious, bishop, priest, or pope. I call this a difficult hour because it is very hard to live in it as a genuine follower of the only Lord, end quote. He goes on to note that, and again I quote, it is much easier to keep on following the many easy lords set up as idols of the moment. Money, power, prestige, and so on. To this list, I think we, could add fear. For fear leads to hatred that seeks to silence the proclamation of justice, peace, mercy, and love, just as fear led Jesus' contemporaries, including some of his own closest followers, to seek to silence him. That very same year, 1978, Romero preached in a manner that rhetorically addressed the challenge before Christians who strive to live in authentic discipleship. He said, and I quote, a church that doesn't provoke any crises, a gospel that doesn't unsettle, a word of God that doesn't get under, under anyone's skin, a word of God that doesn't touch the real sin of the society in which it is being proclaimed. What gospel is that? Romero knew how the enemies of the gospel those who wanted to maintain an unjust status quo from which they benefited at the expense of the poor and most vulnerable were fighting to slander him in the church. And yet he proclaimed with confidence, even when they call us mad, when they call us subversives and communists and all the epithets they put on us, we know that we only preach the, the, the subversive witness of the Beatitudes. 
which have turned everything upside down to proclaim, blessed the poor, blessed the thirsting for justice, blessed the suffering. Romero's response to fear was to follow in the footprints of Christ and preach to his sisters and brothers, not only by his words, but also by his deeds, that this is how we ought to do likewise. He encouraged his fellow Christians and said in one homily, courage, dear friends. I know that for many the hour of testing has come and they have fled as cowards, catechists, celebrants of the word, people who shared with us the joys of our meetings have been frightened. People we thought very strong are frightened away because they have forgotten that this is a religion of life and as life, it must clash with the life that is not God's life, but exists as the kingdom of darkness and of sin in the world. He preached words of trust, strength, courage in the face of fear. He wrote, because it is God's work, we don't fear the prophetic mission the Lord has entrusted to us. I can imagine someone saying, he writes, so now he thinks he's a prophet. <laughs> he answers his own rhetorical thought. He says, no, it's not that I think I'm a prophet. It's that you and I are prophetic people. Everyone baptized has received a share in Christ's prophetic mission. Now we only have to remember that. Romero's preaching and personal witness brings us back to the end of Mark's gospel. In the face of the fear that comes with realizing the demands of Christian discipleship at the empty tomb, the first followers of Jesus Christ fled and told no one. Romero, on the other hand, came to realize the demands of Christian discipleship in the context of El Salvador. He experienced ongoing conversion, and he stayed, seeking to be in greater solidarity with the victims of violence, with the victims of oppression. Romero's life, his preaching, and his death and martyrdom bears witness, which comes from the word martyr, witness to both the manner of life and the true risk of faith. Merton, Hillisum, Romero, each of them provides us with insights not only about how fear can operate as the enemy of Christian discipleship, but also what an appropriate response might be for those of us striving to live the gospel with authenticity and faith. Tomorrow, our last time together, I promise it won't be as long as tonight. This was a little bit long. Thank you for your patience. Um, we're going to shift gears, though, tomorrow and close our time together with a consideration of the role of the Holy Spirit and how it plays a role in fear and faith. And my view is that one of the major contributions to fear as an enemy of Christian discipleship is that the practical reality is that many self-identified Christians don't actually believe in the Holy Spirit. This phenomenon calls for renewed theology of the Holy Spirit. And I hope that it embraces, embraces it aids us, excuse me, in embracing faith and hope in the face of fear. Now you can clap and go home. <laughs> Thank you.